In this week's lecture, we're going to continue our exploration of the visual processing hierarchy. We'll begin by looking at what is known as the dual streams hypothesis. In the second part, we'll focus on various stages of the ventral or what pathway, paying particular attention to the neural representation of faces. In the final section, we'll examine a brain area involved in the visual representation of human bodies. Part one, the dual streams hypothesis. In our previous explorations of the human visual system, we discussed how visually evoked neural information is transmitted from the retina to the primary visual cortex via the lateral geniculate nucleus. Once this neural information reaches the primary visual cortex, or V1, it undergoes a bifurcation into two main streams. One stream, known as the dorsal pathway, projects towards the top of the head and includes postparietal cortex. The other main pathway, known as the ventral stream, travels through the lower left and right sides of the brain and includes the brain's temporal lobes. Each stream is associated with distinct perceptual and behavioural functions. Most of the evidence for this dual streams hypothesis comes from lesion studies. Whilst patients with postparietal dorsal damage can perceive and identify visual objects in their immediate environment, they often struggle when trying to guide their behaviour and interact with these objects. For example, whereas they may experience little difficulty recognising and naming a pen on a table, when it comes to picking up the pen, they may struggle to guide their hand with the appropriate angle and they may fumble with it. By contrast, individuals with ventral stream damage often experience difficulties identifying objects and faces in their visual fields, yet they experience little or no problems interacting with these objects. For example, whereas they may be able to pick up a pen with no obvious difficulty, they may struggle to recognise the object prior to feeling it. In other words, whereas damage to the dorsal stream leads to behavioural problems involving where objects are and how to interact with them, damage to the ventral stream leads to perceptual difficulties involving visual analysis of what objects are. Part 2. Hierarchical organisation of the ventral stream. As we discussed in our last lecture, whereas neurons in the primary visual cortex have receptive fields that are sensitive to simple patterns such as line and edge orientations, and also have small receptive fields. As one then ascends the visual hierarchy, neurons become selective to more complex features and have larger receptive fields. V2, for example, will respond to particular combinations of lines, forming corners and junctions, for example. V4 has even larger receptive fields and responds to specific shapes like squares or circles or star-like patterns. As we reach what are thought of as the highest stages of the ventral stream, neurons become selective to very specific categories of objects, including common inanimate objects and animate objects such as faces and bodies. So important are faces to us that the human brain possesses a specific area whose neural responses appear to be dedicated to the processing of face stimuli. This brain region is known as the fusiform face area, or FFA. 
Some of the most compelling evidence implicating the FFA as a brain area specifically involved in face perception comes from lesion studies. There exist a small number of individuals who possess brain lesions specifically localised to the FFA. These individuals are unable to recognise or identify faces. A perceptual deficit known as prosopagnosia. Interestingly, individuals with such extremely specific neural damage remain able to recognise objects. An implication of this dissociation is that these individuals are able to recognise that a face is a face, but are unable to say whose face it is. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Any sense of familiarity? No. No. What about the, uh, there's a child's face sort of looking over his shoulder. Any familiarity there? This is the nastiest one of all, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this is me. Yes. <laughs> How, how, do you, how do you feel looking at a picture of your own face and not recognizing it? For me, uh, it is a face. It's not my face. Given that selective damage to the FFA causes selective impairments in people's ability to recognize faces, that is, prosopagnosia, this then begs the following question. If the FFA is essential for face recognition, is it also responsible for us perceiving faces in inanimate objects? This is known as pareidolia. Three Australian researchers decided to test this hypothesis. Dr. Susan Wardle and Jessica Torbett. The other researcher is Western Sydney University's own Dr. Kylie Seymour. Their experimental paradigm involved Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or FMRI. While in the scanner, their subjects were presented with multiple stimuli. One block of stimuli was known to elicit illusory face percepts. This was followed by another block of stimuli containing images which don't elicit any illusory percept. They then ran a series of computational training algorithms on the brain activity in various regions of the ventral stream, including the FFA. This training algorithm essentially correlates specific patterns of activity in a particular brain area with a particular class of stimulus. In other words, the algorithm learned to distinguish whether an illusory face stimulus was presented or whether a non-face was presented, based entirely on brain activity. This is often referred to as a neural mind-reading paradigm. Armed with this knowledge, the researchers then presented an entirely new set of illusory face and non-face stimuli to the subjects. Their question was whether or not their trained algorithm could now distinguish between these new illusory face and non-face stimuli. Impressively, they found that it could. Most importantly, they found that the brain area which enabled this successful prediction, or mind reading, was indeed the FFA. This provides strong evidence that the FFA is responsible for our perception of faces. What is not clear from these studies of brain function, however, is how faces are represented within the brain. What information do we use to perceive a face? A simple idea is that face recognition involves analysis and comparison of individual local features, like the mouth, the nose, the eyes, eyebrows, cheeks, etc. In the following perceptual demonstration, we're going to discover that this idea is far from complete 
In this image, we see the upper region of four pairs of faces. As you can see, each pair of faces possesses identical eyes and eyebrows. Keep watching. As we slowly introduce the lower half of each face, you may notice that the upper half of some of these faces changes. In some cases, the eyes change their expression. The only physical differences here are the expressions associated with the lower half of each face. The upper half of each pair of faces remains physically identical, but you almost certainly don't see them as identical anymore. This illusion, known as the composite effect, implies that our perceptual analysis of local face features, the eyes and eyebrows in this case, are compulsorily altered by the emotion of the face overall. That is to say, the global information overrides our local perceptual analysis. Part 4. A body-specific brain area. The last couple of decades have seen an enormous amount of research devoted to understanding how the brain represents faces. But our visual perception of others isn't limited to their faces. In 2007, Peelan and Downing used fMRI to identify a region of brain immediately adjacent to the FFA, which responds selectively to human and to animal bodies and body parts, more so than it responds to faces. Rather imaginatively, they called this brain region the fusiform body area, or FBA. Although neuroanatomical differences have been observed in the cortical representation of faces and bodies, it's not altogether clear what the functional role of the FBA is. One plausible function is to identify individuals from body information alone, when the face information might be unavailable, such as when a human is seen at distance or when their faces are covered or perhaps when optical conditions are poor. One study which shed some light onto a possible functional role for the FBA used transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, to temporarily and specifically disrupt the function of the FBA. They showed subjects images of various hands engaged in different actions, grasping, twisting, pulling, etc. They found that when TMS was applied to the FBA, that judgments about the actions were disrupted, more so than judgments about the shape of the hands. This seems to imply that the FBA may be involved not only in recognising others based on their body shape, but possibly more importantly, analysing the actions that the bodies are engaged in. <laughs>